How about now? Can anybody hear me? Thanks, Mark. Hopefully you can hear me saying this. Uh, thanks for watching the last one. Uh, if everyone can just let me know if their <laughs> beards are soundproof. Uh, if anyone can let me know if it's come up. Beautiful. All right, as I was uh, saying, but you guys couldn't hear. Welcome, everybody, to ball motion number two. Uh, specifically the science of bowling balls and arsenals. I want to thank everyone who took the time to watch the last video. Um, I know it's a little dry, the last one, but it was extremely important that we get the basics out of the way and you understand more about your game uh, before we move on to this section, because none of it will make sense unless you know more about your game. So. Uh, I hope you all took the time to uh, watch some of the other videos and um, find out your pap, find out what kind of bowler you are, your unique bowling characteristics. And uh, I'm really, really looking forward to this session. Uh, this is the number one set of questions we get asked all the time. What ball should I be throwing? Why does this ball not look good for me? Why does this other ball look great for me? And uh, I'm going to help you guys not only understand what balls are going to look better in your hand, but why you need both, even if one doesn't look good normally, and more importantly, what not to waste your money on. We're going to make sure that you get the most bang for your buck. So, I'm just going to make a little adjustment here. <laughs> Full roller cranker and uh, half them. Okay. So, do we have any questions about the last live stream before we go into the new one? Uh, oh, you're not hosed. Don't worry about it. Everyone has a style. Uh, I work with a full roller uh, who lives in South America. And there are plenty of things that full rollers can do and be very competitive. Uh, for you over-rolled or three-quarter rollers like uh, Tom Smallwood, Look how successful he's been. With the right ball matched up to your game, you can definitely bowl. So don't worry about it. So let's see if there's any questions coming in yet. I know there's a little bit of a delay. There's about 30 seconds between uh, when I ask something and when you guys see it. So if I don't get to it right away, please remind me later. So we're going to give about one more minute here uh, before we get started. And uh, I hope you guys brought a pen and paper, because uh, this one's going to be good. And for those of you who have asked in the comment section, I am working on putting together a PDF. It is going to be published on our Facebook, so that it'll be available for all of you free of charge, so that you can go back and check out the things that we have talked about in these Ball Motion uh, live streams. Alright, so it's 8.05. Let's get this uh, let's get this thing rolling. All right guys, once again, I am Robert Johnson. I am a USBC Silver Level coach, a national coach for Team Canada, a PBA member. I wouldn't exactly say PBA professional. Um, I just not, have not... Some people do well, others train well. I am a good trainer. That's what we're going with. <laughs> um, uh, for those of you who are just turning in for the first time, I am uh, a member of Lane Side Reviews with uh, Scoops, Nicholas Porter, and Old Guy Wayne. And uh, we've decided to bring a little bit more training for the average bowler uh, to understand some of the more complex stuff that's going on in our sport. Um, now this is stuff that's covered as a high-level coach that isn't always available to the regular bowler. 
there's something that goes on in our sport where a lot of the time the information is uh, internalized in groups and they hold on to it and don't share it with the rest of us and I don't I don't agree with that I think that for us to become a bigger sport for us to have that Olympic um, acceptance we need to work together to build this sport up so after ball motion one we really want to crank this thing up and get you guys to the next level so without further ado the science of bowling equipment Oops, there we go. All right, so the overview that we've got, we're going to do the essentials of ball scoring in today's game, the phases of motion, and so for some of you, this will be just a refresher, but it's good to have it in your minds while we're looking at the equipment that we're talking about and what we're using it for. Uh, I hope you've taken the time to uh, watch Ball Motion 1, find out what kind of bowler you are and get your unique bowling statistics. Uh, the effective carry, how we create effective carry. Um, hopefully, it'll cover everything that you guys ask. Factors to watch when tracking ball motion. Uh, this is going to be a really cool one that I tell a lot of people about, and um, it has to do with how the ball goes through the pins. And there are subtle factors that you can watch while you're bowling um, that can actually tell you when to make your moves. You don't have to make guesses. Then the important one, all in caps, because I am yelling. It is ball motion, ball selection. Very, very important. We're going to cover based on what kind of bowler you are. We're going to tell you what kind of ball is going to look best for you in your hands on a general house pattern. Uh, and then we're going to help you um, with the characteristics of ball selection and layout selection to create a killer six to eight ball arsenal. Uh, so that's what we got here. Uh, Eli Lee. Oh my, 500 RPM, uh, 17 and miles per hour off the hand, four and a quarter over, uh, three degrees of tilt, 65 degrees of rotation bowling on wood. Oh boy, um, you're really going to like our Ball Motion 3 video that we're going to do. It's going to take us a couple weeks to do, um, but it's going to cover uh, hand position and creating effective roll and different types of effective roll. Um, I feel your pain. I definitely feel your pain. I was there a few years ago. I'm not quite as, as um, rev dominant as you are, but I'm an old man, so that's okay. Uh, even if you're older than me, I'm older than you, because I'm an old, broken man. Um, all right, so let's move on. I hope you guys enjoy the jokes. Uh, I'm pretty self-deprecating. Um, I like to keep things light. Uh, joke in the um, comments if you want. Just remember that um, please keep it clean. Please keep it nice. Um, let's just be good to each other, and let's learn. So essentials in ball scoring in today's game. What does that mean? It means how do we score? We talk about it all the time. To score, you have to have proper execution of your delivery. A very, very wise uh, friend of mine who's also a coach in Florida, uh, Mr. Al Henderson, uh, he once told me that you can be consistently bad, but if you learn to repeat shots, the repeatability of this game, you can learn to bowl on anything. As long as you do the same, you're able to repeat your shot and repeat what you're doing. So, proper execution, number one. Determining the shape of the ball motion that will score. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, just some ideas uh, that I've used in helping me get lined up when I get to tournaments. Um, you have to let the lane tell you where to put your feet. I have this conversation with Scoops all the time, and I know he's probably going to watch this at some point and be like, yeah, that's me. Um, no matter how smart you are, no matter how stubborn you are, you will not win a battle of wits or really any kind of battle at all when you go head-to-head -head with the lanes. 
the lanes are not going to change what they're made out of. They're not going to change the amount of friction they give. The oil pattern is going to change, so really all you can do is play what's there. Lots of people just like to stand on one dot in the center of the lane and throw the ball to their spot, and if it doesn't strike, oh well, it's the lane man's fault. I've been there. We all started as bowlers like that. It's kind of something that we're taught. Um, that we, uh, it's something that we need to change when we're teaching new bowlers. Um, I, I was guilty of it as a bowler too. We, you can't outwit, you can't reason with, you can't argue with a lane. The lane will play the way the lane is going to play, and you either are going to play it that way and score, or you're not going to play it that way and you're going to struggle. That's the way it is. And how the ball goes through the pins is still the most important factor in scoring. Without the ball going through the pins, you get zero every time. So you can actually tell a lot about um, what the ball is doing by how it goes through the pins. And you need to watch to make sure it's doing what you want it to do. You don't want it to just watch it deflect and go, oh, that's fine. Deflect, deflect, deflect. You don't want that. Okay, the ball has to slow down. It's got to go through the pins. Phases of ball motion. This shouldn't be anything new to anybody, but for those who are new to the game. So let's go through them. Skid, that's the front part of the lane. That has the most amount of oil in your generalized lane pattern. There are lane patterns that are very flat, but you will almost always have more oil in the front of the lane than you will in the back of the lane. Uh, the hook area, that's the middle part. This will. This is an important one. Look at the distance between there. We're going to talk about that. It's kind of important. And roll, that last part where the ball goes through the pins. We talked about last week, uh, well at least on the last episode, that the ball, the optimum area for it to slow down and roll through the pins is about five feet in front of the head pin. Um, so if we don't, you know, we don't have a long enough hook zone, or the hook zone's way too long, the ball doesn't get enough time to roll, you're going to see it hit and it's going to bounce off like a rubber ball. Uh, similarly, if the hook zone is too short, it might look like it goes, like it just stands up and goes, or rolls out. Um, or if your skid zone, this is a very common one with low tilt bowlers, your skid zone is tremendously shorter than what's uh, generally out there for matched or speed dominant players, because our equipment uh, rolls much heavier, the way that we release it creates more friction. Um, it's not a good thing or a bad thing, it's just the way that, that we release the ball. And because of that, it sees that friction a little bit earlier. It tends to start to hook a little bit earlier, tends to start to roll a little bit earlier. Um, all the rest of you guys, um, you don't have that problem. You have the problem of the ball going too long. Um, we don't have that problem ever. All right. Woo! Oh, what happened there? Give me a second here. Boom! I love new software. Okay. Phases of ball motion. So let's talk about that skid. It's the highest ball speed. It's just come right off your hand. If you notice, uh, you go to different centers, they measure your ball speed at different parts of the lane. Uh, you'll see a tremendous difference in your ball speed um, off your hand versus at the back of the lane. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, in the skid part of the lane, because it has more oil, um, it's not getting friction. The core is not spinning up. It has whatever revolution you put off on it off of your hand. Uh, so it is at its lowest rev rate. It at, it's at its maximum axis rotation. However you've released it, it whether you're a turner, a spinner, a roller, it'll have its maximum axis rotation. So how, however much it's pointed this way when it's going down the lane. So it can either be going flat and going straight, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. Um, 
that's what it has. Um, the force created by the ball ex uh, speed exceeds the force created by the rev rate. Basically, the amount of force that you've put on the ball as it comes off your hand is going to be generally higher than the force created by the rev rate that you're creating. Um, now this does, as I said, change a little bit with when you get into rev dominant and uh, extremely rev dominant bowlers. So um, for the general part, we're going to keep this the same. So we get to the hook zone. People think that the hook zone is where the ball hooks. And that, I think that's a terminology issue that we have in the industry. Um, the hook zone is where the ball starts to lose ball speed. It's seeing the friction, so it is starting to rev up. It is starting to lose axis rotation as it's getting friction, just like a tire on ice. Eventually it starts, when you see that friction, it starts to go forward again. The force created by the rev rate starts to exceed the force created by the ball speed. Friction's acting on the ball. So if you can see here on the line between skid and hook, uh, you'll see that the ball still projects down a little bit. What we're thinking though is if you saw the actual friction on the lane, at that line it's already started to see the friction and starting to change direction. If you had a marker on your pap, you'd actually start to see it start to tumble rather than being a solid dot. Um, and you'll see it make a dramatic change when it gets there. The roll phase, the least amount of ball speed. If you think about it, the ball skidding and skidding and skidding and skidding, once it starts to see friction, it starts to slow down. Once there's no oil left, there's no chance of it skidding anymore, so it's going to slow down like any ball rolling across anything. Friction acts on it, it starts to slow down. The rev rate is maximized. You think as it started to tumble and tumble and tumble, it finds its point of least resistance um, as it loses tilt, loses rotation, it's rolling forward, it's got the fingers rolling its fastest point. Once again, friction. It has its most hitting power. A ball that is still hooking probably will not strike. It's most generally going to deflect because it's either rolling straight into the pins and has no directional force to go through them, so it hits and bounces off, or it gets there and it's still sliding, so it hasn't had a chance to, to see any friction, and it hits and slides off. Often you'll see it, um, this is where you'll see the ball go out over the 9 pin, over the 10 pin. I've seen actually, I have a photo of a ball we were testing that hit the pocket and split the 9-10. Uh, when it went off the deck. So it had an extreme amount of deflection. Exactly, Rob. What skid? Yeah. Uh, I'm always changing surface on my equipment mostly from 2000 to 3000. We're going to get to that. Don't you worry. Uh, Scott, I also have 3 degrees of tilt, 40 to 50 degrees of rotation, about 200 to 250 revs, and boy, I'm struggling. The less tilt you have, as I said, the more it sees the friction in the front part of the lanes, um, which is going to make it the distance before it hooks, as we talked about surface before. It's going to bring the distance much closer to you before it begins to hook. It can also tend to make it a little more... Um, uh, susceptible to over under uh, especially if the lanes are very wet dry uh, as it has extreme grip and then when it hits the oil again it'll start to spin out um, there are fittings that you can do and I might actually uh, cover that in one of these this is more of, it's more of a pro shop thing though um, that you can change your fit uh, with a custom sport fit a performance fit that can increase your tilt which will help help you a lot Scott so let's talk about the effects of cores and cover stocks on ball motion. Really simple. The transition between skid and hook is dominated by the nature and the texture of the cover stock. All surface. We talked about the distance. You affect the transition from skid to hook, so that distance that you want, by the texture. So um, is it 
urethane, is it particle, is it resin, and the actual texture, the grit that we've put on it. Um, but the entire hook zone, the length of the hook zone is determined by the spin time of a drilled ball. Some of you have never heard this term before. What it means is how fast it takes from the ball being in one position to spin to where the core is at its um, most stable. Uh, we, usually, we usually use a determinator for that. You've seen probably most spin a ball and use a little thing and it makes a little round circle and it looks really cool, but basically it's how fast it goes from, from being in one position all the way around to the other position. Uh, and that's called the spin time. Asymmetric balls tend to have a much faster spin time than symmetric balls. Keep that in mind. The back part. So the tra transition is dominated by the mass properties of the drilled ball. We're talking about layout, RG, differential, intermediate differential, all that good stuff. Um, so when you're thinking about it, if you're looking at getting a ball to hook sooner, cover stock dominates that transition. If you need it to have a shorter hook phase, so maybe hook faster, stand up faster, you're going to want to look at the spin time. And the transition at the back is the literal, that's what the layout is. Remember we talked about that 15 to 20%? All down there. Uh, Seth, thanks for doing these videos. Been bowling for around a year and trying to break 190. Congratulations, that's an awesome, really, really awesome goal to have. Um, I hope we help you out. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, actually, just before we leave that, is there any questions about the phases of ball motion? Um, does it, if you have one, don't um, feel bad that we're not live. Feel free to put the questions uh, either in a message on our Facebook, or you can put it right on this video here afterwards. It won't show up on the window, but we'll try to, to uh, answer it then. Um, so if there are any questions, I'll give you guys a second here. This should be a little bit of a review for some of you, but for a lot of you, this might be the first time you've seen this. So I want to make sure that you guys understand. Um, looks pretty good. Uh, I'll get to it then as we move on. Okay, effective carry. In the old days, we hear this all the time. The ball hit the pocket, the 17 and a half board, left the deck on the same board, and hit the one, three, five, nine for right-handers. One, two, five, eight for left-handers. So basically, the ball hit four pins. That was what I was trained um, in the er, well, late 80s, early 90s. Um, it's what a lot of coaches who grew up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s still teach. Um, however, the modern game has definitely, I mean, it doesn't look like a lot, but it's a huge change. The, bottle enter, the ball still enters at the 17 and a half board, but is exiting on the 21 board for an effective strike. So it's the 1, 3, 5, 8, 9 it's hitting, splitting the 8, 9 directly off the deck. Um, there was uh, some really cool videos with like Parker Bone uh, from Brunswick uh, a few years ago where it was, you know, split the 8-9, I'm done. Um, that's literally what it is. You think about it, it's only three and a half boards difference. But think about the change it's made to scoring in the last ten years, five years. How scores have come up. The modern game has changed literally how we address the pocket. So it's important to think, you know, when you're leaving an 8-pin, when you're leaving a 9-pin, we're, we're already seeing that the ball is not effectively going through the pocket. It's not entering the pocket at the right angle. It's not uh, entering the pocket at the right spot. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea already of things that you can watch to see what your ball is doing uh, when you throw it to make adjustments, uh, whether it be the ball, hand position, foot position, it gives you an idea that it's time to move. Okay, why would I 
don't want my ball to slow down. People ask this all the time, and we talk about ball. I'm very guilty of this. Scoops is guilty of this. Um, we talk about it on our videos about you know a ball being a clean through the front, retaining energy, um, slowing down down lane. Why would you want the ball to do this thing? Well, first of all, you don't want a ball that retains too much energy. A ball that doesn't slow down doesn't strike, doesn't see friction, doesn't go through the hook phase, doesn't go through the roll phase. That's the first thing. A ball with too much friction sees the hook phase too early, sees the roll too, phase too early, still not striking. A bowling ball hits harder after it stops hooking. Remember we talked about it deflecting? Needs friction to roll through the pins. A bowling ball hits harder after it stops hooking, not while it's hooking. A zone of strongest hits. You see that big red spot there. You want it to roll there. You need that. It doesn't matter how much you hit the pocket if the ball is not rolling. You may carry one, but you're going to have a really sad day full of a lot of either sevens or tens. Okay. So factors to watch when tracking ball motion. When does the ball slow down? Remember we talked about it with surface. Looking at distance, changing the surface based on the distance um, that we want the ball to go before it starts to hook. That's number one. When does the ball slow down? To strike a ball doesn't need to hook. You can throw it straight, but it must slow down to reach its maximum rev rate and to roll through the pins. How does the ball go through the pins? We talked about it hitting the 1, 3, 5, splitting the 8, 9. There is another really cool thing that you can watch. For a right-hander, it's the 6 pin. For the left-hander, it's the 4 pin. Watch where that pin goes, uh, especially when you don't strike. It tells you everything you need to know. If a 4 pin or a 6 pin uh, goes in front of the 10 pin and wraps around it, Okay, basically what's happened is, is you've knocked the three pin so far head on that it has gone back, kicked the six pin in front of the ten pin and around it. Okay, If the four pin is going over it or to the other side, to the nine pin side, you've hit the three pin light, light sorry, heavy. Um, so you've forced it right knocking the six pin straight back. So when you see that six pin or four pin, just reverse it for the left handers, it tells you how the where the ball is hitting in the pocket. Well if you're hitting the three pin too much of the three pin, you need to get it to hook a little bit more to hit that head pin. And the secret is move your feet one and one right. One and one. All you're doing is changing about an inch and a half down lane. So what's happening is you're putting the, the ball a little bit deeper into the pocket. It's not getting so much of the three pin. The three pin is now has a chance to get the six pin. Conversely, for the two light and you're blowing the six pin straight back, guess what? One and one left. That's all you need. One and one left. If you're leaving a lot of ring 10s, ring 7s, watch your pin in front of it, 6 pin, 4 pin. It will tell you how to get back to striking. I'm not kidding. And the last one, effective carry. Where does the ball go off the pin deck? Is the ball rolling directly over the 8 pin? Well, it's getting too deep in the pocket. Is it going out over the 9 pin, between the 9 and 10? We talk about deflection. Those, all those factors go together. You can watch those and you can make any adjustment that you need to, to score. Think about it, the ball's hooking too early so it's going through the, it's going through the nose. Well, I'm gonna have to either move left or get a ball with less surface to get that distance, right? We get it in the pocket and you leave a blower six, or a blower ten, it goes, six goes right around it. One or one right strike. Try it. Um, it was something that um, I think Gary Faulkner did a um, video. The um, the Brunswick or the radical guy, not the major champion. Uh, he did a video on effective carry 
uh, and watching that pin a few years ago, uh, and I highly recommend it. If I can find it, I will put it in the comments uh, of this video below after it's streamed. Um, I was, it was really impressive. It made a big impact on me. Um, so I teach it to everyone. I think it's a very easy move. All right. This is the one that you guys have been waiting for. Uh, just hold on one second. Love the videos because you throw similar, but much better than I do. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> the only ball I have had success with is unpol uh, unpolished this conspiracy. We're going to get there. <laughs> Um, it's great on synthetics, but touchy on wood. Absolutely. Um, you know what? Before we get into the ball selection here, I want to take a little bit of time and talk about lanes. Um, just like there are different surfaces on bowling balls, there are different surfaces on lanes. Um, and I know that seems pretty standard, but a lot of people don't think about this. Wood is, especially maple, is very hard, but it is actually incredibly porous. Um, it has the most friction characteristics of any of the lane surfaces um, if they were all the same, like the same age, same amount of games bowled on them, so on and so forth. Uh, it is the one that tends to track more in between uh, the 12 and the 7 boards. You'll see a lot more friction there. It tends to have more topography to it. It'll settle, dent, things like that. So wood is, I would consider, one of the hardest surfaces to bowl on uh, because it doesn't react like a lot of the other ones. It definitely, the topography is incredibly important lane to lane. Um, and your equipment selection is going to be incredibly important because you need to get a lot of natural distance to overcome that early friction. Uh, then you have Guardian, which was basically like a crazy carpet overlay that they ironed onto the top of the wood. So it still kind of kept all of the characteristics to topography-wise of the wood, but now had a little bit less friction. Still a lot of friction going on there. Uh, then we have the AMF lanes, um, which still have a fair amount of friction to them. Um, they play much differently than the Brunswick synthetics. Um, the Anvil Pro Anvil. Uh, you can tell those ones by the, the, we call them cheater boards, the hash markers down lane, the darker boards. Um, all of these lanes play differently. So making your equipment selection, make that selection based on the lanes you're bowling on as well, um, knowing how much friction you're going to see. Does our show, oh, yes, 100%. You know what? I'll tell you, synthetic changes with the weather. Uh, I helped um, build a bowling center quite a few years ago, and when it went in, it went on concrete floors. And no matter how much vapor burying, no matter how much insulation you do, in the winter, you can see the, the barometer change and the pressure drop because you can actually sometimes see the lanes start to move and bend panel to panel, especially if somebody opens like the back door and it's really warm inside, you can see a, a dramatic change in the lanes. So there's more going on than just, you know, what you see or don't see in the oil. There's a lot of different things that go on. Okay, ball selection. Asymmetrical versus symmetrical. The front part of the lanes to the break point is dominated by the cover stock and its surface. We talked about that, the distance we create with the uh, pads that we use, the changing of the grits. Um, it helps control when the ball slows down, dull balls hook earlier than shiny balls. Um, company to company. Um, we've seen a change with the way that pearls are created lately. Um, there are a couple of companies, uh, Brunswick being one of them, that rather than actually doing a poured pearl, uh, it is now an additive that is uh, put into the base urethane cover stock or the resin cover stock that creates the um, the properties of what you'd see in a pearl ball without it being actually that poured different kind of cover stock. It allows them to be much more precise in what the ball does. Um, I think EBI does the same thing. I'm not sure. I'm not one of their staffers. Um, but it allows them to tailor it and use their really good cover stocks more. Um, such as like the um, the Kingpin Rule 
and the white quantum bias have the same base cover stock but they have different additives in them to make the ball do slightly different things based on what the core does once the ball slows down the back end of the lane is dominated by the balls design so we've got core shape um, and what we do to that core by putting the holes into it a lot of people think you know just oh I'm, I'm putting this here and the pins here so the balls laying in such a direction and that's all of it but when we drill into a ball we actually drill material out of the core and we reshape that core uh, it's why they have that rule that a ball can only be uh, plugged I think it's like three or four times plugged and redrilled because the original properties of the core are lost after you've redrilled it so many times and it may not adhere to USB-C um, specific rules so the first step in creating ball motion is ball selection matching the ball type with the bowler that seems pretty easy right this is where everybody gets I, I don't want to say screwed up but um, people ask a lot of questions so we've identified our unique bowling characteristics our speed rev rate tilt rotation things like that now we can look at how they play into what equipment we should choose and there is specific equipment that will look better for bowlers for some bowlers than others so symmetrical balls have a long hook phase and a shorter roll phase this makes them more continuous continuous means they hook they continue to hook longer and more more um, they'll tend to continue through the pins rather than um, be more deflective um, it makes them better for slow ball speed uh, bowlers like old guy Wayne um, even though he's our speed dominant player because his speed and his rev rate don't match his rev rate is very low he still has a fairly low ball speed um, ranging anywhere from 12 to 14 miles an hour so symmetrical balls sometimes look a lot better for him they look good in the hands of high track players if you're a high track player you're also a low tilt bowler rev dominant bowlers uh, I don't think I've met uh, a high track player who isn't a rev dominant player but I know they're out there so I wanted to put that in there very specifically and no thumb bowlers you'll see a lot of two-handed bowlers have more success throwing symmetrical equipment because it's the hook phase is uh, much more continuous it's not going to be as jumpy because they can create a lot of side rotation they don't want the ball to go and turn like snap they want it to be more controlled Earth Shades as a high school. I wish the course would go down to 12 pounds. Uh, there are companies, uh, I believe there are two companies out there that do uh, full cores down to 12 pounds. All of the companies will do some kind of core, um, but you start to get into more of just that light bulb. That, um, it's a more of a lower differential course. So you don't get the same performance out of those lower, those lower weight balls. Asymmetric balls have a shorter hook phase. Looks like they stand up and change direction quicker. And a longer roll phase, which is important for knowing how far we want the ball to be rolling forward. Five feet from the pins. Uh, making them transition much sooner and making them better for high speed. So your rev, your very rev dominant, or sorry, speed dominant players. Your spinners, so people who get the ball to spin this way rather than rolling and low rev players now that brings up an interesting question we've got old guy Wayne who is both a slower ball speed and a speed dominant player so doesn't he fit into both these categories but here's the thing guys in a good arsenal Hey Ernesto, in a good arsenal, you should always have both kinds of balls. And we say that one looks better in your hand naturally because 
um, it matches up to your bowling characteristics. But if you have a three ball arsenal, say a spare ball and two balls, if one ball does not look like it's going through the pins correctly, you want to go to a different kind of ball. Uh, this is the famous, well, you know, I left a 10 pin and then I made a one board move and then I left a forward pin, so I made a move for that and I left a 10 pin again and I made a move and I left a 7 pin. After that 4 pin, I'm probably changing balls. Um, the ball literally isn't rolling through the pins correctly, and we're going to cover that uh, in just a second. So, ball selection. How much flare is too much flare? Now, I know we all love to drill that ball with that between three and three eighths and four and a quarter inch pin to pap, which gives it the most amount of flare according to the, to the flare chart. But more flare isn't always what you want. More flare represented by the total differential of the drilled ball is good for high speed or rev challenged bowlers or if you are on a very oily pattern and you need the ball to spin up a lot getting new fresh cover if you look at every one of those turns one of those flares one of those circles around the ball is getting new cover it's creating its maximum amount of friction which is getting it to start to transition so you speed dominant players high Lots of, of flare is good, lots of surface is good, strong layouts and, and asymmetrical balls are good. You need the ball to slow down. Conversely, you want less flare for rev dominant low speed players. You give a guy who throws 12 miles an hour a ball with 7 inches of, of flare and I'll show you a guy who's got a ball in the gutter before it hits the cheater boards. It's just how it's going to work you give him his maximum amount of friction and maximum uh, potential of hook, it's going to hook off the lane. Uh, same thing with a rev dominant player. You give a rev dominant player a very strong ball with lots of surface, um, a strong layout, lots of flare, that ball is going to hook at his feet. For us low tilt players, I can throw a, a, a twist and get it to roll at my feet. It's just the way things work. <laughs> Me too. That's right. So, ball selection characteristics of symmetrical ball motion. Longer hook phase. It retains tilt longer. We talk about the low tilt players loving symmetrical balls. Because we only have six or seven, eight degrees to work with, we need that ball to retain that tilt to create more distance for us. So symmetrical balls tend to look better in the hands of lower tilt players simply because it gets us more distance by retaining axis tilt. They tend to be better for short patterns. You don't want a ball that's going to roll off 34 feet and stand up as fast as it can. It's going to do that already with all that dry. So symmetrical balls tend to look best, at least better, on shorter patterns. They're more continuous. They continue to hook instead of rolling forward. Asymmetric balls, once they find their, once they've, they've made their move and they roll, they will eventually just roll straight forward, which is where you get a lot of deflection. Better for track breakdown. Um, you know, when you got to move left all night, you want a ball that's going to keep hooking back, keep coming back. You don't want to make the turn and roll forward. And better for high track players. We talked about low tilt. Um, a lot of high track players, depending on the layout you use, especially with asymmetric balls, if you try to, to do a pin down ball, we talked about in that flare unsafe zone, man, will that thing thump over your fingers and your thumb, or even go between your fingers and thumb, making you like an over rolled or a three quarter roller. Um, so, symmetric balls are going to look awesome for those players. That's me. Asymmetric ball motion, shorter hook zone. We said that stands up straighter. Longer roll zone loses axis, uh, loses tilt as it hooks. 
So it lays down faster because of that unevenness in the core. For those of you who don't know the difference between symmetric and asymmetric, this would be symmetric, okay? You could take a slice of it and all the slices are basically the same all the way around, okay? An asymmetric one would be uh, a hand. If you slice this hand in, in half, I would probably cry, um, but it wouldn't be the same. You couldn't take a piece and move it to another piece and it would look exactly the same. Another great one is a beer mug. Um, it has the handle on it. If you took that piece out, it wouldn't be the same as any other piece around the entire thing. Um, so that uneven weight, let's call it that, um, causes it to lose its tilt faster and lay down faster. Low tilt bowlers do not want to lay down faster. That reads the lane faster. Bad, generally for us. That will cause us to need a lot more surface changes and a lot more spe special layouts to get the balls to work properly for us. For you speed dominant and matched bowlers, doesn't matter. Matched bowler can use either of these because they're not dominant in one thing or another. Um, and as we said, the asymmetric balls, because they tend to transition a little quicker and stand up faster, great for you speed dominance. Better for longer patterns. We talk about needing the ball to stand up and get to the pocket quick. On a longer pattern, when you have less amount of uh, friction down lane, you want that ball to stand up and get to the pocket. It has a heavier, roller, a heavier forward roll, uh, better for carry down, better for low track players. If you're hitting the pocket and not carrying or stop carrying, the first change of the night after making your adjustments with your feet uh, should be to change from one type of the ball, one type of ball, to the other. Um, and we're going to talk about this more in depth in the arsenal creation, and you'll see why uh, we do it this way. It'll make a lot of sense when we get there because you're going to have two pieces with the same amount of hook that go through the pins differently. Okay. Let's get sciency. Um, and I'm going to give 100% of a shout out here to uh, the Hall of Famer and legend Chris Barnes. Uh, Chris Barnes did an absolutely inspiring um, lecture on equipment selection uh, that I had the fortune of uh, watching and it's uh, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of building an arsenal now it makes it very easy um, and it allows you to look at um, a lot of other people's ways of building um, uh, arsenals based on ball motion uh, like the CTD one, the four types of ball motion, the traction, continuous, uh, straight, and angular. This It actually works into this as well, so it's really cool. So, uh, let's go through the basics. Low RG wants to roll earlier, aka its natural length. Medium RG is normal, normal. High RG wants to roll later. This is the old figure skater adage that we've talked about. You watch a figure skater, they put their arms out as far as they can. That's high RG, closer to the cover basically. The weight extends closer to the cover. Um, it has a harder time spinning up, but will eventually spin up. Low RG is when they pull those arms in tight. You see them start really spinning really fast like a top. Same thing. That's low RG. Total differential how much overall potential hook or flare, and this is the important part, uh, is in the ball. Because hook is a function of the cover chemistry and the surface. The flare is the engine. Like we talked about, it's a 500 horsepower beast under the cover. Just gotta make sure you have the right tires on it, the right surface. So how much potential flare to create hook there is. Intermediate differential, how sharp the break point is going to be. The bigger the intermediate diff, the quicker uh, and the harder the transition. That's going to be the shape of the, the motion. And it's only 
in asymmetrical equipment. Now that doesn't mean um, technically that there isn't intermediate differential in symmetric balls. Uh, the USB-C allows up to 0 .008 um, intermediate differential before it's considered an asymmetrical ball. Neat. Science. So, uh, Chris Barnes and uh, Mark Baker did a little bit of a study themselves and they realized that every 0 .04 inches of RG equals a potential of three feet in distance in the ball. So if you had three balls with the exact same cover and the exact same cover preparation and the only thing that was different was 0 .04 inches of RG between each ball, so each one went up 0 .04, each one the first one would go say 40 feet, the next one would go 43 feet, the next one would go 46 feet. These are the kind of numbers that I wish we taught bowlers. If you think about what's in your bag, think about the RG after drilling, because without holes in the ball we don't care. Think about how the pieces that you throw react based on the RG. Lower RG balls tend to hook earlier because they spin up faster shortening their distance, letting them see more friction. You raise the RG, the ball goes a little bit farther before it starts to spin up and see as much friction, because it's harder to spin it up. And as it keeps raising, it gets harder and harder and harder and harder. So we can take this information and use it effectively to help set our distances based on surface grits, surface types, and layouts, specifically RG, total differential, and intermediate differential, after drilling to create the shapes that we need in our bag to create an arsenal. Anybody's mind blown yet? Because we're going right into Wonderland now. So for ball selection, everybody asks about those numbers that you see on the balls. You know, the, the differential and stuff. Well, here is a very easy and clear way to figure out what you're buying. From zero differential to zero thirty, it's a low differential ball. Generally produces or wants to produce three inches or less of flare. The smaller the differential, the shorter the hook transition. The bigger the differential, the bigger the hook transition. From 31 to 45 is medium differential, four and a half inches of flare. So that's a, a decently strong ball, but not super, super strong. And then 046 to 060 is high differential, lots of it. It's that ball that you see that flares from one side of the ball all the way to the other. Uh, if you guys remember, remember uh, Motive got in trouble because they produced a ball that was supposed to be 060 uh, and ended up um, a sample size that they did came up at, I think it was 062, and they had to get rid of all the balls and replace them. Um, 060 is the highest differential. Um, I've seen balls with higher differential out there, but I believe the USB-C um, limits it. Oh, actually, I know they do. Uh, Ellie Lee. Uh, what's the difference, the distance difference in grits? Just wait, we're going to get there. <laughs> Intermediate differential. This is not important. I know this is dry, guys. Um, but this is plays a lot into, into what we're doing here. The intermediate differential RG measures and ranges of inches from 0.08 to 0.037. As we said, the, the 0 to 0.008 is symmetrical. Uh, 009 to 020 is mediate, a medium intermediate differential um, as y-metrical. Uh, that should be asymmetrical. Uh, and then 021 to 037 is high intermediate differential, differential high flare asymmetric. Um, I have rarely seen balls over uh, 024 
Uh, I know, however, that there are a couple companies that have some really ridiculous ones in that 030 range, and they stand up and flare a ton. Um, I'm not sure if that much is necessary, but you know what? It's available to you as a tool, so I'm not going to complain about it. Okay, RG Layout Surface Arsenal. This is what you guys have been waiting for. 0 to 20 feet dominated by the cover. 21 to 40 feet managed by the RG and ball speed. 41 to 60 feet managed by flare and axis rotation. Arsenal should be made up of several ball types allowing you to create control and angular motions. Now what we're saying here is that surface dominates the front 20 feet. RG, how fast it's going to spin up, and your ball speed is going to push. Remember, we're talking about where the hooks, the skid and the hook transition. And then managed by flare and axis rotation down lane, where the ball has lost all its, or should have lost all its uh, tilt. It should be starting to roll forward uh, within five feet of the pins. And hopefully, has, still has some drive left into it to go through the pins. Now we talked about control and angular. Uh, your control balls, um, if you want to equate this to like a CTD um, with their ball motion, are going to be your traction and your continuous balls. Uh, they're going to fall into, into two different categories, um, but generally your control will be of those two and your angular will be your pearls. So the control ball, when do you use it? The lanes are tough when the lanes are wet dry. So when you're having problems consistently getting to the pocket, it's not a high scoring pace. You're just trying to get the ball there, take a few strikes, make your spares. It's your controlled go-to ball or balls. Doesn't have to be all of the following, but should be most of them. Between 500 and 2000 grit, low RG, symmetrical, and while we're still allowed weight holes, and where you are allowed weight holes, they should be very shallow. They should not touch the core. And the layout should, con con should create end over end roll. For a lot of people, those are going to be um, a higher val number, a higher drill number. So we talked about the layouts in the last one. So the maximum layout distance and the slowest response to friction. This allows you to keep the ball in front of you and it allows you to play a little bit more directly to the pocket with the maximum amount of surface. Angular balls. When do you use these? These allow you to, to take two to three boards that you're shooting at and make it three to five boards. It just opens the pocket up. More angle to the pocket creates a higher scoring pace. And that was the second part. When the scoring pace is high, when you see people start to throw those higher games, you know you got to go to something angular that's going to allow you to high risk, high reward, strike more, potentially. As we said with the control balls, it doesn't have to be all of the following, but it should be most of. RGs move up 2.50 inches plus. So we're already looking at creating a difference in distance from the RG in the ball. Asymmetrical, so we know it's going to stand up a little bit faster, which is that angular motion. Allows for maximum axis rotation. Okay, This allows you to get around it, to twirl it, spin it, fluff it, whatever you guys want to call it, to create the, the where your pat comes back facing you more than when you're throwing your control ball, which allows it to react to the friction down lane much faster as well, creating a much more hockey stick motion. Weight holes, where allowed, uh, need to be one to three inches past the your axis point. Very small and very deep. We're reshaping the core to change the differential, intermediate differential, and RG to create a ball that goes a little longer and has a little bit more of a stronger move to the pocket. Does it have to be a pearl? I would say yes. Um, now as I said, companies have changed the way that they create 
uh, their balls. So a lot of pearls have different um, additives used to do different things, and so do some of the solids. But for the most part, companies produce the balls to do what customers think they're going to do. So a ball that is produced to be angular tends to be pearl. Faster response. Um, and that's how they build the cover. So, here's a sample six ball arsenal for a matched player. <sighs> Excuse me, need a little bit of water here. So your heavy oil control ball, your HCB, is going to be a low differential ball. You see I recommend about a 2.48 uh, 2.47, 2.49 in that area is going to be good. Um, it's symmetrical, so it doesn't have an intermediate differential, so 0 0.00 up to 0 0.08. And, sorry, intermediate differential, and a differential of 0 0.55, so very high flaring. Reason for this, your heavy control ball is played um, when the lanes are oilier. You need to keep the ball in front of you. Uh, you want to play it a little straighter. So you want to have the most amount of surface on it. Uh, we recommend about 500 as your base. You're going to want to adjust it based on the surfaces and all of these surfaces based on the, the type of, of lane that you're bowling on, the type of tournament you're in. Allows you to play farther right, straighter, and not give up the heads while breaking down the lane. Uh, another thing you're going to see here in the layouts, the layouts of your heavy control ball for the most part are going to be uh, what we would call pin down. As we said in the last one, most people think pin down, pin down. Uh, we're talking about slow response to friction, so high valve angle, high drill angle. Um, the pin is going to be five and a half, or five and a half to five inches pin to pad. So when we talk about symmetricals, we know that makes it a very long distance naturally for the layer or for the pin to pad. It's creating more distance and more of a hockey stick shape. It's going to get down lane and, and get in. It's not going to be really jumpy early in the lane, but it is going to slow down. Uh, next up we have our heavy angular ball, HAB. So this is a 2.48. Uh, we said you can go up to 2.5. There aren't a lot of 2.5s out there. We know this. Um, if you go to a lower RG, you are going to have to adjust the surface to get that distance. You want the, you want a little bit more distance, a little bit um, less surface so that the ball retains energy while still being able to slow down down lane. Uh, so for this one we said asymmetrical 2.48 with an 0.24 differential so it's going to stand up fairly quickly and an 0.55 uh, differential so it's going to have a lot of flare thousand grit so we've moved up now somebody asked about the difference between 500 and a thousand the way we look at it, this is stepped so the differences between 500 and thousand is actually three steps there's 500 500 plus compound 500 plus polish 1000 1000 plus compound 1000 plus polish and so on and so forth so we've naturally created with surface a couple of extra feet of distance in this angular ball so that way it doesn't get bogged down in the in the oil but still um, has enough leverage left in the core with the intermediate differential and the flare potential to stand up down lane so low RG high differential tall pin positions this is going to be your pin up layouts uh, now for myself as a low tilt bowler my slow response layouts, traditionally called pin down, are to the right of my finger. If you look at my grip, my pin will be right about in line somewhere around here. So basically uh, parallel with my ring finger. My heavy angular balls, the pin will tend to be up around here. Even though they're not up here, you know, in between your fingers, anything like that, they are still the difference between the hot, the fast response and slow response layouts. That's why I talked about not worrying about pin up and pin down. 
because they're meaningless when it comes to using mathematics and your given unique bowling characteristics to pick balls and layouts. If I were to throw an actual pin down ball, it's actually a, a very pin down ball for me. I would adjust my pin to pap down to like a two inch. It would still be in line with my fingers, but it would be much shorter, much farther away. Um, so as I said, pin up, pin down don't mean anything anymore. Tall pin is your fast response layout. Slower response is what your, your pin down would have been. Um, strong mass bias position. You want a mass bias position that's going to make the ball stand up the fastest. Um, and that comes with your generally your tall pin layouts. Um, but not always. Uh, so when you go and talk to your pro shop operator, you can say, I want a ball with a tall pin position and a strong mass bias. It creates more length and a faster response to friction than the heavy control ball. You use this if the s when, excuse me, when balling down, if the scoring pace is low. So you throw your heavy angular ball um, and it's hooking too much. It is just too strong, too early, stands up too fast. If the scoring pace is still low, nobody's shooting the lights out, you go to your medium control ball. Just want to get it to the pocket, leave yourself something easy to spare. If the scoring pace is high, people are shooting 250s, 260s, you're going to want to go to your medium angular ball. Keep the pocket open where you can score, but get yourself a little bit of extra distance and a different look at the pocket. Is that 500 grit true cut pads? Uh, this is based on Aberlon. Um, but I will show you later. I do it with my with my true cut pads. Uh, I so I use my 500 true cut. Your medium control ball. So we're still at 248 to 252. So we're now looking at that 0 0.04 inches of RG that we can create distance specifically with the ball we're choosing. We've gone still with a symmetric ball, so no intermediate differential and we've lessened the, um, the differential on it to 035. This means it's going to be in that three to four inch flare. It's not gonna have a dramatic motion. It's still gonna hook, but it's not gonna be one of those stand up and turn left balls for you. It's gonna be controllable, get you to the pocket. So we're saying 2000 grit, that is, gives it the maximum I don't know if anyone's ever told you guys this, but they consider 2000 grit to be the maximum mid-lane grit for getting the ball to read the mid-lane the hardest. Um, just something to keep in mind. Um, so medium RG, medium differential, symmetrical. Uh, I don't know why that's misspelled. Uh, that's probably me. Um, low RG, slow response layout still. Four and a half inch pin to pap. We still want to be able to keep that ball in line. I know it's awesome on a house shot to hook the whole lane. Here's the problem with it. And I used to do this all the time and I complained about it all the time until I saw this kind of thing and realized what I was doing wrong. Um, if you start your night as far left as you can go, playing over the fourth arrow, the center arrow, out to the five board and you're striking, what happens in a game? Now you're five boards left of last stop. Uh, maybe seven boards. If somebody else is in your area to start chewing it up. Now you gotta go 10 boards left of last stop. 12 boards, 15 boards. You're starting to get into somebody else's lane. Then you take a ball and you're like, okay, I'm gonna go back right again. You move right and you throw it and it skids right through because you've created a hook spot that changes the distance of the ball in the middle of the lane so you can't get the ball to read it properly. You want to play, and I know this sounds weird because we always want to get the maximum uh, angle of entry, but you want to also play as straight to the pocket as you can. The more you play to the side of your hand, so if right-handers playing to the right, left-handers playing to the left, um, the more potential you have for oil later 
so that you're not worried about running out of things and having to loft the ball and getting so far over. This is also very, very true for flat patterns. In flat patterns, you may get five shots out of an area before you've got to start inching. If you are already all the way left, when you start inching in five frames, you've got another 31 frames to go that you're going to be on 10 pairs down before you can score. So we want a ball that can, we can keep in front of us. Medium angular ball, 252. We've taken that extra distance. An intermediate differential of 018 to 021. So it's not going to stand up quite as quickly as our heavy angular ball, but it's still pretty fast. Lots of differential, so we still have lots of flare. So for grit, we're saying 2000 grit plus polish, 4000 or a 4000 pad. Uh, I tend to do mine with um, my P5000 pad that I got from CTD. Um, I am not a fan of polish personally um, just because it can wear out differently. It can wear out um, in spots along your ball and you can get an, an incomplete uh, reaction. The surface tends to go uniformly so I tend to use pads for this but if you want to use polish power to you. It is your personal choice. I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong. I just don't like it. And once again, tall pin position, strong mass bias position. We're talking a five inch pin to pap here. So on an asymmetric ball, this is going to be max flare. So anything over that, I think it was two and a quarter line is max flare. But we've pushed it down the lane, so it's going to be very strong down lane motion. Creates even more length and a fast response to friction than the heavy control ball. So. When balling down from these balls, if the scoring pace is low, you go to your dry control ball. If you're flat tenning, you need the ball to get through the pins and, like we said about that carry, get through the 1, 3, 5, and split the 8, 9. You're going to go to your dry angular ball. And let's talk about those. Dry control ball. 248 to 252, so we've created a little bit of length there. We're still keeping no differential and, uh, sorry, low differential, no intermediate differential. We want a very slow response layout in a four and a half inch pin to pap. We want this ball to go way down lane before it reads. It's a dry control ball. If there's lots of friction, it's dry. Uh, this often tends to be your urethane ball. Even though urethane reacts the earliest, this tends to be your urethane ball specifically because it can also double for your spare ball. When you are limited to the amount of balls that you can take, uh, say you're going to, um, uh, like the men who just got back from the, from the PADCOM tournament, um, you're limited to six or eight balls. You've got to have a space for a control ball and your spare ball. If they can both be the same thing. Um, lastly, your dry angular ball. Your dab. I'm sorry. Uh, 254. We've already started to create a little bit more distance. Um, I would actually probably even push out a little bit farther to 256, 257. Um, we want an intermediate differential of 008 or less. So that would be a symmetric ball or a very weak asymmetric ball with a very, very low intermediate differential and a medium, um, sorry, uh, a low differential symmetric, high RG, medium high RG. 3000 grit plus polish. You want this ball to get way down lane. The polish gets it down lane but keeps that total amount of hook so it's going to be a little bit faster response down lane. It's going to get way down and snap. Angular. Tall pin position. 5 inches plus pin to pap. No weight holes. None. Even if you have weight holes available to you, you notice that um, we talked about weight holes in the first one, specifically to get them to roll a little bit earlier or be a little bit uh, more dynamic off the spot. In the last slide 
for medium control, notice, benchmark, nothing about weight holes. No weight holes. If you have to have a weight hole, put it on your PAP. That has zero effect on the uh, RG of the ball uh, in a way that will change your distance or the amount of flare uh, or where it's going to read on the lane. It has a if we talk about you know the old Mo thing, the P1, P2, P3, P4, your P2 hole, which tends to be your PAP, has no effect on equipment. A P1 hole, I think, is minus 20% uh, of uh, dynamic performance. P3 is plus 20, P4 is plus 40%, or something of that nature. Um, so no weight holes. We don't want this these balls to to roll earlier or be more dynamic. So let's put this all together. This is my current arsenal and we're going to talk about some differences here. We have my heavy control ball being a, cons a conspiracy at a thousand grit. In, um, in the notes we talked about having 500 grit on, on the, that ball. Well, I am a low tilt bowler. I don't have a problem getting the ball to see friction, which is why you have more uh, surface on the ball. So I can use a little bit of a higher friction on a ball, or a higher grit on the ball to keep it from rolling at my feet. A lot of people, when they bought the Dragon, the uh, Katana Dragon, the first thing they would say is, well, the ball's not hooking. And when I got them to send me videos and send me layouts, what was in fact happening is the ball was skidding through the first five to 10 uh, feet of the lane and the hook phase was basically at the arrows so it was rolling forward by the time it hits 30 40 feet and just looks like it's going straight which is why a lot of low tilt bowlers tend not to throw high end strong uh, covered slow response um, or uh, not slow response sorry high end covers with a lot of friction uh, potential to them now we also said symmetric. Uh, I recently went to the Conspiracy Solid as my heavy control ball. Um, the I had a Magnitude 055 that had a hole in it that I replaced. And while I really, really like the Method Solid that came out, uh, it was a little too slow response for me. I really liked how clean the conspiracy is that's the additive package that they used that gets it down lane and still allows it to be smooth but hook a lot um, for my layout for this I am 70 by 3 and 3 quarters by 20 so I have a fair amount of natural length built into the into the layout uh, a fairly strong uh, pin to pap placement and a very fast response val angle so this is my tall pin ball and if you look at the layout when when the fingers my pin sits way up here it is a tall pin with a strong uh, a not strong um, mass bias position because I don't need that help this layout swings the uh, mass bias into my thumb making it with that layout a symmetric ball if you were to put it on a determinator, it would spin to my thumb, which is a hallmark. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a hallmark of symmetric balls. They all spin to the thumb. So I have created a symmetric ball for my heavy control ball rather than choosing one. Heavy angular ball. Conspiracy Pearl at 2000 grit. As I said, we want to create that little bit extra dis distance from 500 to 1000 with three steps. We went from 1000 to 2000. Um, the additives create about, with this surface, create a three foot difference in length before the ball hooks. This is also a tall pin. Um, and I know we said slower response ones for the Conspiracy or for the heavy control ball. This is just something that I am currently trying out. Um, as I said, the other balls that I had had the slower response, big, strong layouts. This is something I'm just testing. Um, and I'd love to have your feedback on what, uh, if you try this, what you test in that spot. 
Um, and for you speed dominant players, don't be afraid to go with more surface. Your heavy control ball, I've seen people hit them at 180. It l it'll look like a snowball, as Mo would say. But as long as it slows down, you can carry. Medium control ball, Intel Solid, it's the good old 035 differential at 2000 grit. It is my benchmark. Uh, it is the reason that um, I would say s between it and the Squatch uh, are hands down the reason why my average has gone, even for myself, has gone up drastically this year. Uh, it is an incredibly controllable ball. Uh, for those of you who throw Radical um, or Brunswick or Deviate products, um, just buy an Intel Solid. Uh, there are other balls on the market that do this. Uh, I think most notably the Web from Hammer. Um, very similar things. I just I like my Intel. Um, I have three of them. I love the Intel. Um, it is a slow response layout for me. Uh, I have it at 90 by 3 by 45, which puts the pin uh, right about here, about an inch from my finger. Um, and I'm going to post a link to a picture of my arsenal in the uh, in the comments below so you guys can kind of get a better look at it. That is my pin down, or slow response layout. My Squatch. Uh, I took it up to 1,000 plus compound plus polish. Um, now we talked about doing steps and how we, ch we change the... Um, we change the distance on the ball by adding compound. When you put polish on top of it, you are also covering the ball. Um, I could have done it with a P5000 pad. I could have done it with their polish. Um, I prefer on my Squatch to keep it close to out of, what they consider close to out of box. Um, I just created a little bit more distance with my surface. Rather than going to 2000 plus, plus or 2000, 4000, I went 1000 compound polish. It's just a different way of doing it. I highly recommend people um, experimenting. You can do all you want in arsenal construction, but getting down in the lanes and knowing what the ball is going to do and how they're going to react is important, and part of that is experimenting. Uh, my dry control ball, my good old Brunswick Phantom at 500 um, As a spare ball, it's very easy for me to control. If the pattern gets uh, where I need a urethane ball. Um, I, I have no problem flattening my hand out and creating a straight ball motion so that um, I can shoot spares with it and throw strikes with it. Um, and we're going to talk about that in ball motion 3, about hand motions. And my uh, dry angular ball. I have my vapor zone at 2000. If you look at the RG on that, it is a 254 uh, with an 011 differential, I believe. Um, so I took that sucker up to 2000 plus polish, or uh, recently, as I said, I just moved over to the P5000 pad, which gives it a more consistent, uh, longer lasting uh, than the polish. So I, I kind of like that better going 2000, 4000. Um, now, that is my six ball arsenal. I can pretty much walk into any center and the only thing I would have to do to match up with just about any lane condition is just make sure my surfaces are on. Because I have six balls that give me very defined motions um, that will work on any lane surface, lane condition to give me a look at the pocket. Now we talked about how the ball goes through the pocket differently. A lot of the times you'll see a symmetric and an asymmetric paired simply because those two balls will get to the pocket in roughly the same way. It allows you to change the way the ball goes through the pocket. If you're hitting the pocket really well with a symmetric ball, um, but it is just not carrying, you've made, you've made zone changes, you've made foot changes, by changing the way the ball is going to roll through the pocket, if it's going to be less continuous, more rolly, more continuous, you can change your carry and you can start scoring again. There's been lots of times where I've gone, I've, you know, been through practice, shot the first game, not miss the pocket, get in the second game, go 10 pin, 4 pin, 
and I'll pick up another ball and change balls and start striking again. It happens all the time. Just because, one, I know what the ball is going to do, because I have it set between my heavy, medium, and, and dry types, but be just simply because it's going through the pins differently. Huge difference. If you can only have two or three balls in your arsenal, one symmetric, one asymmetric, one spare ball. Okay, now we talked about eight ball. When you have an opportunity to take an extra bag, I generally tell people to call it their emergency bag. Not that it's an emergency like, oh, I've lost something, but it's two balls that have different motions or different uh, properties to them than what you have in your arsenal. This is also where your tried and true ball would go. Everybody has one, that ball that they're super comfortable in, that when they know they get into trouble, they can just go to it and they have supreme confidence in it. Um, this is where that ball would go. Uh, yes, this is going to be on the channel after I'm done. Um, what, off topic, would I recommend Eileen's Bowling Buddies, Swing Trainer for Bowlers? 100%. Um, uh, it's a little, I'll get back to my thing here in a second. Um, when I got back from the tour in 2014, uh, I had blown my shoulder out, completely tore it up. Um, I was having problems with my fibromyalgia. Uh, basically, they wanted to replace my entire shoulder, um, the socket on the arm and, and the shoulder. Um, Rex and Sandy from Eileen's Bowling Buddies, uh, Rex has passed, bless his soul. Um, he got together with me and I started working with the trainers and I completely rehabbed my shoulder, completely retaught myself to bowl with Eileen's Bowling Buddies. There is not a better training mechanism on the planet, bar none, period. They were the first, they're the original, they have the patents for the original designs. Um, they're amazing. I cannot thank them enough because of their rehab. Um, the ability to rehab with these products, not just learn how to bowl and practice off the lanes, but to rehab with them allowed me to keep bowling. So yes, I would 1000% recommend them. Uh, now, back to this. Um, so your, your alternate balls. So for me, uh, I have my go-to ball, my comfort ball, used to be my Freak Show Pearl um, that I had a P-1 hole on it. Um, I actually drilled the pin out as the weight hole. Um, and I love that ball and I actually replaced it with my Prowler uh, which gave me a similar motion in, an a, in a low differential, low intermediate differential asymmetric ball. Um, I, you can see it's basically my direct replacement for my squatch. If I get in, into a position where I know I'm going to need the ball, my angular ball to sit up a little faster, um, I will switch my squatch, which is symmetric, to an asymmetric. Just for that different, the way it's going to address the lanes different, the way it's going to address the pattern and the friction differently. Excuse me. Once again, if you're a speed dominant player, you can play with these a little bit, as I've done as a as a rev dominant low tilt bowler, to make them fit in. But this gives you an, a kind of an idea. Same thing as the dry angular ball, the quantum bias pearl. Take that sucker up to 2,000 plus polish, or 2,000 plus uh, 2,000, 4,000, 2,000, 5,000. It is a high RG ball with lots of differential and lots of flare potential. So we're gonna get lots of distance by changing the surface on it and allowing it to be very angular down lane because the ball naturally will be harder to spin up so it's not going to read as early so if I know I'm going to a place especially with wood lanes um, I want something that I'm going to get the maximum amount of distance out of that I can it's going to be hard for the lane to spin this ball up um, so that's for you uh, Eli Lee 300 I don't even know if I'm even close on that. Um, but that is my that is my six ball slash eight ball arsenal. So layout selection. Layouts for symmetrical and asymmetrical balls are different because the balls are different. They do different things. We've talked about one standing up, being having a shorter hook zone, 
Longer roll zone, one having the opposite. Drill angles on symmetrical cores are irrelevant. It doesn't matter. It could be zero degrees. It could be 359 degrees. The drill angle does not matter. As my good friend Nick Smith would say, CG no matter. Hashtag CG no matter. He should, he should get like a royalty every time somebody says something about CGs on, on symmetrical balls. Um, it is only the pin to pap and val angle that will affect the roll characteristics of a symmetric ball. Um, if you go back and look at the um, layout that we did on our cutting edge uh, hybrid, I think we did like 315 degrees on it. With the new rules about weight holes, it makes no difference. None. Just the pin to pap and the val angle. Lay, uh, select layouts that complement your ball selection, your unique bowling characteristics, and the desired ball motion. You generally, generally don't want to put a something that's going to make a ball more angular on a ball that's supposed to be smooth. Or you don't put a big, um, you know, ex expecting a big flaring layout on a ball with low differential. It's not going to do what you want. Complement what the, bowl, the, the bowler does and what the ball wants to do. You can't argue with a lane. You can't argue with a bowling ball. And don't try to make the ball do something it's not supposed to or that can be done better by something else. <sighs> don't say, well, I'm going to buy this ball and make it do this because I want this ball. Just buy that ball. When people ask me, oh, you know what? I've got a katana, and I love that motion. What should I buy? I tell them a katana. If you like the way a ball works, replace it with the same thing. Further to that, since we've looked at the science behind it, and we know the, um, the RG and the differentials, and how the cover and the surface and everything work on creating that motion, you can look at what's in your bag and what you want to replace and replace it with the same thing, either by numbers and cover or just by the same ball. There's a reason I have three Intel. There's a reason I have three Squatch. There's a reason I have four Conspiracy. The ball is really, really good. I have different layouts on it around the same thing in different surfaces because why buy a different ball if that's the ball you like? Uh, another question here. I'm a silver level uh, coach, Ipsia certified. Can I contact you via email? Absolutely. Uh, anybody that wants to contact us, um, you can contact us at laneSideReviews at live.com or send us a message on our Facebook. Uh, if you're not a member of Facebook and you don't have email, uh, send a carrier pigeon. I will put some seed on the back porch and we'll see if it gets here. Um, but I am generally always available. It might take me a few days, up to a week, to answer things. We get a ton of questions. Um, but I promise you I will do my best to get back to you and answer any and every question you have. Um, I know I look scary, especially with this big shaggy beard. Um, but this bearded beast is a friendly teddy bear. So if you have questions, even if you don't want to ask them here, just send them to us. Scoops answers questions too. Um, if you have very specific ones for something that I've talked about, just give me a shout. And I will answer everything for you. Okay. That's the end of the slideshow, guys. Um, I know that was a lot to cover. It's an hour and a half. Um, that was a lot of stuff, but I want you to, to think about the balls that you like and your unique bowling characteristics and see how they match up. How many of you fit into the categories and like your symmetric balls and bam, that is what you're supposed to have, or asymmetric. Um, I know for myself it made a huge difference tournament-wise. When you look at a house pattern, um, we often called it clift or easy, the china, all different sorts of things describe a lot of oil in the middle, a lot of friction to the outside, so you can guarantee that if you throw the ball to the friction, it's going to see it and come back. 
layouts and surface tend to get a little muddled there because it's an easy place to score. When you start looking at harder patterns, when they get flatter, and uh, might be a good thing to do one on how to read one of the one of those lane sheets. Um, as they get flatter and the ball naturally wants to hook more um, from, or the, at least the same amount from any place on the lane, that's when you really have to look at this ball selection and be able to create different motions. I know the very first. Um, PBA regional I went to, I was in a wood house in Muskegon, and I had brought a lot of fast response equipment. I had uh, practiced a lot on the pattern. It was a 42 foot pattern, um, and everything that I threw where I was required faster response balls that were cleaner, relatively clean up front. So that's all I packed. I packed nine fast response balls. Well, when I got there, and they were wood lanes, and the ball was hooking at my feet, and I realized I had nothing I could play in the center that was going to get down lane effectively, I was done before I even threw a ball. This way of creating an arsenal will allow you to walk into any place not knowing what the lane conditions are, what the the um, the condition of the lanes physically are topography things like that how much friction how old they are how long it's been since they've been resurfaced so on and so forth and have a chance to score simply by changing a little bit of surface and it's mostly on your higher your higher hooking stuff your, your heavy control and medium control so you can go in there and let your bowling do the talking rather than saying well you know what I didn't have the right equipment this literally gives you every piece of equipment you need to score but before I did this I wanted to put it to the test so I entered two tournaments one in Welland one in um, Scarborough both of them all I took were my six ball arsenal. The very first one I got out there and the first thing I did I went to my uh, benchmark ball. Uh, looked good, I found the pocket. I tried going to a stronger ball. And this is where we're going to talk about lining up a little bit. I went to my regular shot, threw my benchmark ball, it was in the pocket, boom, easy strike. I said okay I know that shot's there now. I want to I want to test some things. So I moved right and threw one up the gutter to see how much friction was there. And this is the one in Welland. Then I moved left and tried swinging it. So I've thrown three shots to kind of judge where the friction is. Then I tried my Intel again, struck no problem. I went to my Squatch, threw it, and it was just, it got to the pocket, but it was just a little bit too long. Just a little bit, by about two or three feet. So it wasn't quite rolling in the right place, it would hit, ring 10, ring 10, ring 10. So I knew my intel was right. I played my intel for the first three games, made a move uh, as the scoring pace opened up a little bit to my vapor zone. I shot 940 for four games. Okay. I felt the pattern was a little easy though, so I decided to try it again. Went to the event in Scarborough. Once again, exact same thing. And through my intel, it was a little early, but it got to the pocket. Um, so I made a quick adjustment, threw it again, and it got to the pocket. I threw one on the outside to find where the friction was, moved inside, threw one my heavy control ball to see if there was anything weird going on, if it was going to catch and flip, uh, if it was going to hook and shape to the pocket. Then I went back to my to the middle and I threw my medium angular ball, my squatch. Well, it turns out my squatch from my original position was awesome. It looked spectacular. Uh, first game I throw it, no problem. Second game I throw it, no problem. Third game we change sides of the house. It's a back to back house. There was a little more friction on that side of the house. Excuse me. So I ended up balling down to my vapor zone. 
through it no problem. Went to the next lane, there, it hadn't been bowled on it. It was the designated rotating uh, breakdown pair. So it still had a little bit, a little bit more oil than the other ones. Back to my Intel. I shoot 910, uh, which was one of the higher scratch singles. Um, I think it was like the second highest on my squad, and, and I ended up 25th. It was a, a scratch tournament, so I, I lost to some people who came in with 170 averages who suddenly averaged 220. But I feel like averaging in that 230 to, to 240 range with this arsenal, just making that change is fairly sound proof in my in my mind um, it also had a dramatic effect on my league my average uh, I started the year pretty slow and ended up uh, putting I think 15 pins on my average in the span of about four weeks and this is in the November December area not at the beginning where it's real easy um, so that's it for me. Uh, I'm going to take about three minutes of questions here until 9:45. This will be available on the um, on YouTube, and we'll link it on the page. As I said, send in any questions you want. Um, do I provide lessons virtually and in person? Absolutely, I do, Rob. Uh, if you want to give me a shout, uh, Laneside Reviews at Live.com or on our Facebook, you can get there by going to LaneSideReviews.com. Um, we can definitely talk about it. Uh, I coach players. Uh, I have players in 12 countries around the world, plus um, some of the work I've done uh, locally here. So, yeah, absolutely. Conspiracy. Uh, can you notice a difference between the hitting power of the dynamic core? Yes. Um, I know some people say that it's a marketing gimmick, um, but the restitution, uh, the coefficient of restitution uh, shows the how the energy goes back out. Uh, Brunswick did an awesome video with the um, quantums, the first set of quantums that came out, uh, the new ear quantums, and then when Dynamicore first came out, and they actually show the ball bearing hitting and how it, it, it transfers energy. There is a visible difference. Um, basically, it's just a little more dense and it makes it react like a two-piece ball, which generally because the cover stock is so heavy they have to always make it higher RG um, to get the weights right. Uh, I think the, the, the core in the Quantums is like 12 pounds and a normal core is like 6 or 8 pounds. So it's a, it's a fairly significant difference. Um, so guys, um, if there's any questions out there please feel free to send them through. Um, I'm hoping everybody's enjoying this. Uh, it'll be a few weeks before we do ball motion three, which will be hand motions. Um, this is a busy tournament season, so I'm going to be out. I'm also going to be coaching uh, some of my youth and um, adults all over the world. So it's going to take us a little bit more time to put it together. I really hope that you guys have enjoyed these videos. I really like sharing this with you guys. Um, when I started as coaching, there was lots of coaches but no information and every coach had their own idea. Being able to share like this and put scientific information out there to meld with the the art of bowling takes a lot of the guesswork away of what we do and allows us to focus on just repeating shots and becoming better bowlers. Everybody wants that magic ball that's going to make you strike, that's going to make you perfect. It doesn't exist. you got to repeat shots at least somewhat close. Um, but this will give you the opportunity to just worry about throwing shots. That's what this was for. So I hope you guys liked it. Um, and like I said, we'll see you guys in, in, in a couple of weeks. So if you have more questions, send them through um, lanesidereviews at live.com or send them to our Facebook. You can get there by going to lanesidereviews.com. Don't forget to support us on Patreon. If you like this kind of content, please go give a dollar, give five dollars. All this goes to us buying new things like this new software so that we can do these live streams, um, getting us some new cameras so we can do some new um, those new angles that you guys wanted. It helps give you 
the bowler what you want. So please support us there. Also go to Spreadshirt. We got some amazing designs on there. You can have uh, some really cool ones. King of Two-Handed Style. You can have the many faces of Wayne on there. Will I be at Bowl Expo? Haven't decided yet. Still working on that. Um, I really, really love going to, to Bowl Expo. I don't know why more people don't. So if I can be there, I will be. Um, but other than that, guys, I think that's the end of Ball Motion 2. So send those questions through. And uh, until next time, guys, we'll see you lane side.